And joining us now on the line from New York, New York, Bliss Broyard. She is the author of One Drop, My Father's Hidden Life. Bliss, it's good to meet you. Thanks for being on TVO tonight. It's my pleasure, Steve. Thank you. Just before we get to the one drop and what that means, let's do a bit of background here. Your father, Anatole, was a literary critic at the New York Times, very important man on the literary scene. What was your sense of him, though, as a dad growing up? Well, he was a great dad. You know, he worked at home, um, which I didn't realize was so unusual until uh, I got a little older and saw that most fathers went to work. So he was seem seemingly always available for, you know, playing and throwing a ball in the backyard or just kind of listening to whatever antics I'd gotten up to at school that day. So he was quite involved and, and present and um, a very protective father as well. Protective in what respect? Well, he, uh, he never wanted us to leave <laughs> the house. <laughs> he would say, um, you know, when you get a little older, we can um, build a, a garage with a little apartment over it. And so when you get married, you could just continue living here. And that will be very convenient. You know, if you have kids, we can babysit. So he, he kind of never wanted to uh, let us get too far from home, um, which after I learned more about his own history, kind of made a poignant sense for me. Well, this is what I wondered, whether you meant protective in the sense of his secret. And I, I want to get to that if, if I can now. When your father was dying of cancer, you knew that there was a family secret, but you didn't know what it was. Your mother broke the news to you and your brother. So go ahead, tell us. What did she tell you? Well, she said it was this, my father had intended to tell us, but he said that he wanted to get his thoughts in order. I remember he said exactly that he needed to order his vulnerabilities so they didn't get magnified during the discussion. But unfortunately, before a, a day, the, ne the day arrived where we were all supposed to gather and he would reveal this news, he ended up back in the hospital. He was quite ill at this point. And, uh, and it was just this horrible afternoon where we witnessed him having these waves of terrible pain. Um, and finally, we got a nurse to knock him out with some morphine, and then my mother took it upon herself to tell us, you know, your father is part black. And we laughed. Um, we, it was a great relief. You know, we had known that there was a secret for a couple of weeks, and we had imagined that he'd seen a murder when he was a kid, or there had been incest in his family. So that he was part black um, didn't seem like a big deal, and it was only really until his memorial service a month later where I met his family, his two sisters and my cousin virtually for the first time. I, I'd seen them once. Um, one cousin, My grandmother and my aunt I'd met once when I was six. Um, that the import of his decision, what he'd done, started to really dawn on me. In fact, you said in the book that you were thrilled and it made you feel like you mattered in a way you hadn't before. How come? That's right, because I, you know, I grew up um, with a very kind of simple-minded idea of uh, how to solve the racial tension in the United States of, you know, well, if we just become this giant melting pot, if everyone marries everyone else, then there won't be any more tension between black and white. And I, you know, I had I had bought into this notion of the American melting pot, and uh, and I felt suddenly that I was a part of it, that I was, you know, had a place in American history for the first time. Even though you thought of yourself as a nice little waspy girl growing up in, in the northeastern part of the United States. Well, that seemed in the 70s and 80s that seemed kind of like a boring history to have, you know that. Um, lots of kids growing up, you know, what we watched on TV was shows like Dynamite and Good Times and The Cosby Show a little later. And uh, so there was a lot of, you know, we listened to soul music and Michael Jackson. So there was this sort of aspiration to be black in some way or to certainly to um, adopt, adopt some of the culture. So this seemed like a much more exciting kind of background. Hmm. Let's, uh, admittedly, this is going to be in the realm of speculation because your father never did get that opportunity to tell you why he did what he did. But mm -hmm. he spent his life trying to pass as a white man. And, and do you now have some better sense after having, you know, obviously analyzed it and thought about it, about why he needed to do that? Yeah, I think it's, it was a complicated, um, I, I don't think it was actually a decision for him. I don't think it's, it, it's as if he one day said, I'm going to step across the color line and I'm never going to look back. Um, I think he just stopped announcing, you know, his background or where he was from, things that would kind of indicate to other people um, what his background was. But I, I did meet people who, um, whom he had told that he said colored on his birth certificate or, you know, he was a Creole from New Orleans. Um, and I think that he would have said that in, wa in one aspect, perhaps for him the most important aspect, is that he just didn't buy into the notion that black people and white people were essentially different and that these racial classifications were that meaningful about a person. Um, for him and for many of his contemporaries in the 40s and 50s, you know, he kind of ran away from home to Greenwich Village 
who you were depended upon you know what you thought your opinions of the books that you read the art that you liked it wasn't determined by your your family background so i think that he in a way just tried to live above racial labels but of course you know that it was very convenient for him to to make that argument and it certainly benefited his life his life was much easier he had access to a lot more opportunities he wasn't he wasn't confined by the stereotypes and and the limitations that came with being black in the 20th century in America. Do you think he could have got the job as the New York Times literary critic had he been openly black? <laughs> no. Um, at the time that he got it, there had never been a black critic on staff of a daily paper in the United States outside of Negro newspapers, as they were then called. And in fact, um, after he retired from the position, he moved over to the, the book review, the Sunday book review, uh, there was an African-American editor, a woman named Rosemary Bray, who applied for his position. And she was told um, when the editors, her, the higher-ups, looked at her portfolio that her writing was too black-oriented, um, mm -hmm. that she wasn't seen as you know, being, having broad enough knowledge for the job. And of course that was the case because often black writers were assigned other black writers to review, or if you were a, a black journalist, that you were set up to Harlem, or you know, set to cover uh, various aspects of race relations. So it was a sort of catch-22 for people. Hmm. Fill in the blank here, if you would, for us. The fact that my father never told me about this makes me angry, indifferent, sad, disappointed. What is it for you? Um, I think sad is the word that comes up first for me. Um, you know, I think it was it was quite a burden for him and I think it was quite painful for him and uh, I think that you know he loved his family he was a real family man at least in the way that he demonstrated the way that he um, in our family acted he seemed like a real family man so I'm sure it pained him in some very deep way to to cut off his relationship with his with his parents and his sisters and his and his nephews um, so, so I think it's it's very sad that he wasn't able to kind of unburden himself um, to his kids at the end of his life. Um, but it, you know, it also makes me angry because as much as I've tried to kind of make up for lost time, and and establish a relationship with my father's family, you know, it just won't be like as if we'd all grown up together. I'm never going to be able to duplicate that. Mm -hmm. There were people who knew though that he was passing as white. Yes. And many, you, many people. But you had not had any contact with them during the course of the secret period, is that right? No, I think, you know, lots of people knew. I mean, I, I had a hard time, in fact, breaking it to very many people um, because it was, it was sort of good gossip about him. But I think that they thought it was perhaps one grandparent, you know, it, and it wasn't in fact, both of his parents were in fact um, black according to this country's one drop definition of one drop of black blood makes you black. They were legally black in Louisiana where his family was from. Um, so I think that, that he created this kind of illusion that he had this colorful biography um, and that, that included this, you know, part African ancestry, but he made it sort of not matter to people. Uh, so I don't think it, it occurred to anyone to really, you know, that it was the sort of secret that needed to be broken to the kids. Hmm. Now I'm trying to remember here, you were what, 23 when you found out? I just turned 24. Just turned 24. Okay, so mm -hmm. your mother now says, okay, your father has this African-American heritage to him, but you kids aren't black. You're white. What was your reaction exactly. to that? It was confusing. <laughs> you know, it didn't seem, the more and more I, well, the, the kind of logic of the way that race is defined in the United States is, is not logical at all. It's very confusing. So this was just, you know, another kind of um, drop in this, in this bucket of, um, you know, well, what am I supposed to call myself now? And, and for a long time, I, I searched, um, you know, through books, and I, you know, I thought that perhaps I could find some sort of, you know, algorithm or a decision tree where I could plug in all the strange circumstances of my own upbringing, you know, had been raised as white for 23 years, found out that her father was black, and come up with an answer of what I was supposed to be. Um, part of the process of, of writing the book was trying to answer that question. But more and more, um, I've become sort of suspicious of the question itself and, and, and where it originates from. You know, in the United States, it originates from the legacy of slavery and, and Jim Crow discrimination. In order to separate people, you had to define them. But let's take the other end of the continuum. A lot of people are just curious. So if they were to ask you today, you know, mm -hmm. we're spending the whole week here on TVO trying to understand, better understand identities and what groups people think they belong to. If I were to ask you, what are you today, what's the answer? 
I would say I have mixed race ancestry. Um, I don't feel I have the right to claim that I'm black uh, because I think of an identity as something that is the sum of your experiences, how you've lived, and it wasn't the way the ra I was raised, and it's not what people see when they look at me. Uh, but at the same time, you know, I want I want to claim it in some way. It's important to me. It's become very much um, a part of who I am. So mixed race feels like uh, the appropriate answer. Is it important to you because it gives you that connection to your dad or a greater connection? It, not only to my father, um, but also to my history. I mean, I, I feel kind of a part of the fabric of America and the American story in a way that I, I never really did before. You know, I kind of see that the way my father's own family, the Broyards, are, are emblematic, um, that they, they came, in fact, to this country in the 18th century. They were here, you know, much earlier than my mother's Norwegian ancestors. And so I, I can see now how the, the events of history had a, a direct impact on my, fa my father's family's life and my own life. And so, um, you know, it's that also that I want to claim. Okay, I hear what you're saying, but, uh, and this is a little delicate, so I'm going to try to phrase this carefully. Mm -hmm. There will be people with darker colored skin than you who may say, come on, lady, uh, you, you really don't have any right to claim that. You haven't suffered in the way that we have. You're pushing it a bit here. What would you say to them? Well, um, I think, you know, people said the same about Barack Obama and, um, you know, the fact that he is not descended from slaves um, doesn't make him African-American in the way that, that other African-Americans who are descended from slaves are. And I, I understand that, and it is a delicate, it is a delicate question. Um, at the same time, that legacy has, is why Barack Obama might have a hard time getting a cab, or perhaps not anymore, but, you know, <laughs> had at one time um, in New York City or Chicago. And that legacy also uh, forced my father to make this choice um, to, to pass and for his, his parents to have to pass in order to get work in the 1930s and the 1940s in New York City. So, um, you know, I don't, I don't think of um, racial identity as a club that you either belong to or not. I think that this is a legacy that we, white people and black people have all been affected by. Okay. Once you learned of your father's identity and you learned of this added history, uh, I know you tried to seek out um, descendants from that side of the family. Mm -hmm. uh, what did you find out when you did that? Well, um, that there were a lot of them. <laughs> they, I have quite a large extended family that I've gotten to know across the United States. As a matter of fact, I've helped to arrange two reunions, the first in 2001, where we had 100 people in, in New Orleans, and then one this past summer, last summer. And uh, there's, you know, my father's story was actually not that unusual. There's quite a lot of um, members of the Broyards family who made the same choice to cross the color line in the 40s or 50s, or even a little bit later, uh, to in order to get jobs that wouldn't have been available or to um, go to a better school or to escape discrimination. What did you find out about your grandmother in terms of any possible connection to slavery? Well, um, my, I, I was never able to find a slave ancestor in the United States, um, though I suspect that, that they're there. But I um, had become convinced that my father's grandmother, my great-grandmother, had been born into a family that either um, were enslaved at the time or had just recently been emancipated. But uh, in doing my genealogy, there was a, the name was Marie Cousin, and I had been researching a woman named Mary Cousin. I just assumed that it had been anglicized, the name, as many records were. And sort of late into the research process, I realized I had been chasing the wrong woman, and that, in fact, she wasn't um, born into a family of slaves. But her family was, uh, was, were free black people who owned slaves um, mm -hmm. right prior to the Civil War. And so that, again, um, challenged my notion of what I thought the typical you know, African-American narrative was. Gotcha. And again, as you have gone through the analysis of looking back at your life, can you recall whether or not in your formative years growing up, whether you were, and I'm, I'm not going to say racist because that's too strong, but did, did, assuming that you thought you were growing up in a typical white family, did you have kind of either negative or pejorative feelings about African Americans at the time? Well, I actually would use the word racist. I mean, I think I acted in ways that, that seemed racist. Um, of course, you know, had you asked me if I was racist in, in the, when I was growing up, I would have said no. My parents were educated and, um, you know, fairly liberal and 
Uh, but I think it's very difficult in the United States to ex escape the very pernicious influence of racism. And so I, you know, I recall making racist jokes in high school. Actually, there was a time I was sitting at the cafeteria table and um, one of the three black students in my private high school was sitting there and I, I made a joke. Um, you know, and we had started making joke about blondes and then amputees and sort of ratcheted up the offensiveness from there. And, uh, and it had, you know, we, we didn't mean him, this guy sitting at the table, um, he was also at private school, like kind of one of us, but of course, um, you know, he, the joke I'm sure was very painful and I, I wanted to apologize for years, uh, but I was worried about what he would think of me, um, that he would, you know, that he would judge me as a racist. That was my concern about how I now looked in his eyes, not, of course, how he had felt. Mm -hmm. Bliss, one last question. You got a two-year-old, right? Mm-hmm. My hunch is you're not going to do to the two-year-old what your father did to you, <laughs> namely keep this thing a big secret. No. But have you thought through, you know, when you're going to tell the family story and how you're going to tell it and all of that? Well, you know, I think that she'll just grow up around it. Um, I see my father's family um, frequently, you know, many of whom look like black people. We live in a mixed neighborhood now in Brooklyn. Um, so she's on the playground with people of all different backgrounds. So. You know, I hope that it will always be just kind of an organic sense of who she is, and it's not something I'm going to have to sit down one day and kind of break it to her, like this big revelation. No, I hear you, but if it doesn't dawn on her that she has this link to an entirely different community than she may think she has a link to, how will you handle that? Well, I mean, she'll meet, she knows her cousins, um, and I think she understands that she's related to them who, who are black. So um, I think that she'll probably understand it, um, you know, without it, it needing to be explained. But, you know, the tricky thing is how, when we start, start applying to schools and how will we define her. And I don't feel right um, having her benefit from affirmative action. Um, but at the same time, you know, so I've I already, in, just in applying to, to nursery school, you know, I've identified all of her background, but also explained that she doesn't look that diverse. Mm. Um, you know, and we don't, our, our story's a little atypical. So, um, you know, it's something that she'll always kind of live with, I think. Bliss, it's good to meet you. Thanks so much for sharing your story here. One Drop, My Father's Hidden Life is the name of the book, and we're grateful you could spare some time for us from uh, New York City tonight. Thanks so much. Thank you.